Welcome to another day as we continue our journey through the Word of God. Glad you're joining me. Uh, if it's the first time, you can follow along on uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, podcasts. Links are always in the description below. And don't forget to comment, like, subscribe, share, do whatever you can. Help us get the Word out. Today we're going to be looking at Psalm 17. A Prayer of David is the title of this psalm. We don't know the specific time in David's life that he wrote this. Uh, this psalm just shows David's incredible trust in God. It, it, it's his lack of confidence in himself and his total confidence in God that always allowed David to come back to being centered to his own true north. And he always understood God's hope in the scheme of eternity more than in the scheme of what David could just see around him. But it didn't mean that he wasn't very honest about the crises that he went through in his life, uh, which is just the same for us. We have to be honest about the, the, the different, we go from crisis to crisis to crisis. And I think sometimes we, we, we don't know how to be real about those crisis situations. And at the same time, expressing total faith and dependence on God with a calm confidence that he's got it under control. And that's what this uh, Psalm of David is, Psalm 17. So let's read uh, from verse 1. Hear a just cause, O Lord, is how he starts it. Uh, he's starting off by declaring the justice of his cause. He believed that God should listen to his prayer because his cause was just. Uh, Guzik says this, it is entirely possible for someone to think that their cause is just when it is not, or for both parties in a fight to each be absolutely convinced that their own cause is just. We cannot automatically take these words of David to ourselves and immediately judge our cause as just, yet we can look at our cause as impartially and dispassionately as possible, looking at it from the perspective of others, which is very not always easy, to the very best of our ability, and to be more concerned with what is truly just than simply what favours us. Spurgeon said this about this particular psalm, a cry is our earliest utterance, the first thing you do as a baby, and in many ways the most natural of human sounds. If our prayer should, like the infant's cry, be more natural than intelligent and more earnest than elegant, it will be nonetheless eloquent with God. There is a mighty power in a child's cry to prevail with a parent's heart. And that's how David starts this off. Attend to my cry. Hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer, which is not from deceitful lips. Let my vindication come from your presence. Let your eyes look on the things that are upright. Even though David was very convinced about the justice of, the, of his own cause in this situation, he was going to be careful to speak honestly about the problem. Uh, he hasn't done something. He hasn't deceived somebody. He hasn't hurt them to deserve the current situation that he's in. But he's not going to withhold facts from God in his prayer that would somehow undermine his cause, which I think is what most Christians do. When they pray a prayer to God and they feel like they've been unjustly done by, they're like, they leave out the points where, well, that's kind of questionable and might look bad on me. No, David just didn't do that. In Psalm 139, David prayed, search me, O God, and know my heart, try me, know my anxiety, see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of the, the everlasting. Uh, I think David probably said words like that before he prayed this prayer in Psalm 17. He, he comes with a, a, a confidence in God that his own heart has been tested with truthfulness. Let my vindication come from your presence. David did not want his vindication to come from himself and his own justification. Uh, David had many long battles with King Saul. And he had a few opportunities where he could have just set things right himself, but he didn't do that. He waited until vindication came from the presence of God. Uh, this is one of the most important ways that David left the problem up to God, if you like. I refuse to take matters into my own hands. I'm going to wait for you to solve it however you want to. But ultimately, 
I'm going to wait for the vindication that comes from just your mere presence. Uh, so let your eyes look on the things that are upright. David phrased its request in a way that really put more emphasis on God's justice than on David's own cause. He, he believed that his cause was just, no doubt about it. But he spoke in a way where he said to God, I understand that it's more important that things be upright, not just whether I get my own way or not. Guzik said this, David's idea was something like this, Lord, I believe that my cause is just and I have searched my own heart for deceit, yet I wait for your vindication and I want you to do and to promote what is right. If I'm not on your side, move me so that I am. Let's move on to verse three. You have tested my heart, past tense. You have visited me in the night. You have tried me and found nothing. I have purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. Concerning the works of men, by the word of your lips, I have kept away from the paths of the destroyer. So David invites here the test from the previous verses. And here he says, I've actually passed that test. You have tried me, you have found nothing. And it takes a great deal of patience from a mature Christ follower to let, to let God test your heart like that. Because you have to accept the fact that you might actually be wrong and that somebody else might be right. And we must be much more interested in God's justice and his determination of right and wrong than we are in just us winning our cause and feeling vindicated. We have to come to God with a word from his word and have a heart that's ready to be convicted and corrected if we're in the wrong. That's the, that's the position you have to put yourself in. So we have to ask ourselves this question. Do I allow God to test my heart? Can I be corrected? Will I listen to others when they tell me that I actually might be wrong? He says, I purpose that my mouth shall not transgress. David was, what does he mean? He, he's saying, I'm going to be very careful not to speak in a way that's sinful about this situation. By the word of your lips, I have kept away from the paths of the destroyer. Uh, this is one of the reasons why David had developed a maturity in his process of self-analysis. He lived by the words of God's lips and he knew, he loved and he lived his life from God's word, not his own. And it was this word that tried David and found nothing. It was the word of God that gave David the wisdom and the strength to keep away from the paths of the destroyer. David had to learn this lesson over and over again through the trials of his life. He had to protect himself. He had to protect his family, his men from Saul, but he couldn't allow himself to become bitter and twisted against Saul, who really was a destroyer, but he'd been anointed by God. So we move on to verse five. Uphold my steps in your paths that my footsteps may not slip. David knew that he was very much in danger of slipping into a disastrous position. He needed God to uphold his, uh, his steps so that his footsteps may not slip. Because he wants to be upheld, but he only wants to be upheld on God's path, not the path that he's walking. So you can see David's constantly giving God opportunity to correct him, even though he's in a situation where he's been totally wrongly done by. He's making it all about him. What, what, what have I got to get right here? Psalm 17 verse 6, I have called upon you for you will hear me, O God. Incline your ear to me and hear my speech. Show your marvelous loving kindness by your right hand. O you who save those who trust in you from those who rise up against them. Keep me as the, the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings from the wicked who oppress me and from my deadly enemies who surround me. I've called upon you for you will hear me. Again, David displays this incredibly calm confidence in the midst of a crisis that says, I know you will hear me. Even though my problems haven't gone away yet and I've not been vindicated. I know when I call, you'll hear. Guzik said this, we don't make such arguments in prayer because we can. In other words, putting our case towards God as if, you know, like, oh, well, I need to outline the facts for you, God, because you're, you know, even though you're God, I need to tell you what happened. 
He says, we don't make such arguments in prayer because we can, through brilliant or persuasive arguments, somehow convince God to do something that he doesn't really want to do. <laughs> um, and David knew that. So that's why he says, show your marvelous love and kindness by your right hand. Uh, it's actually the first time in the book of Psalms that we see the word for loving kindness. And David asked that this special kind of love be shown to him by the power of God through his right hand. Uh, the, the word for loving kindness means a steadfast love, a true love. But David spoke more than of something than just loving kindness here. He spoke of a marvelous loving kindness and by your right hand. Spurgeon said this, the wonder of extraordinary love is that God should make it such an ordinary thing, that he should give to us marvelous loving kindness. See, many people only expect a small degree of God's loving kindness because they feel they're not worthy of his marvelous loving kindness. And so what we do is we actually limit our prayers, our expectations, our faith, based on our own judgment of ourselves. And we're like, well, I'm not really that good, so I can't really ask God for his marvelous loving kindness because it's not exactly like I've been, you know, doing everything I should be doing. And David says, no, if you want to ask for his marvelous loving kindness, you have to start off by making sure that you give God an opportunity to correct you first when you're bringing a cause to him. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Uh, this was a, a phrase that has been used for thousands of years, literally, uh, to describe something that was precious, that was easily injured, uh, some, something that needed protecting, our eyes need protecting. David wanted to be kept by God as if he was something valuable, even if he was a little bit fragile compared to God. And uh, the apple of your eye, that terminology was used in De Deuteronomy chapter 32, Proverbs chapter 7, Zechariah chapter 2. And it means this, to be kept with many guards and protections, to always be kept safe, to be kept from the small things like dust and grit, to always be kept sensitive and tender, to be kept clear and unobstructed, and to be kept as something beautiful and eminently useful. So then David goes on and says, hide me under the shadow of your wings. Wonderful picture uh, of, of, of conjures up in our mind, a picture conjured up in our mind through these words, the shadow of your wings. A mother bird having these little chicks under her wings and they're protected from predators, from the elements and from all the other dangers that are around. Uh, David also uses it in Psalm 36, Psalm 57, Psalm 63, and Jesus actually used the same word picture himself in Matthew chapter 23, talking about Jerusalem and his desired care for the city of Jerusalem. So you've got apple of your eye, keep me under the shadow of your wings. Uh, when you look at those two pictures together, they're very powerful about taking us to a place where we can understand how much God actually cares for us. We are the apple of his eye, and he protects us under the shadow of his wings. How's that? Protect me from the wicked who oppress me, from my deadly enemies who surround me. I mean, yeah, these people are not good. The, the threat that David faced were, was a real threat. Uh, it wasn't just oppression that made his life difficult. It was people who wanted to kill him. And so what did David do in the middle of that? He just prayed. He simply prayed. Verse 10. They have closed up their fat hearts with their mouths. They speak proudly. They have now surrounded us in our steps. They have set their eyes crouching down to the earth as a lion is eager to tear his prey. And like a young lion lurking in secret places, arise, O Lord, confront him, cast him down. Deliver my life from the wicked with your sword, with your hand from men, O Lord, from men of the world who have their portion in this life and whose belly you will fill with your hidden treasure. They are satisfied with children and leave the rest of their possession for their babies. Fat hearts. David begins to describe his enemies. They've got fat hearts. In other words, they're just insensitive. They can't feel anything in their heart. And that whenever they speak, they speak out of pride surrounded us in our steps, set their eyes, crouching down to the earth as a lion. David describes these people as if they're like a wild beast who wants to destroy its prey. So 
David says, Arise, O Lord, cast him down. God, I understand that my protection is coming from you. Not because he was afraid of a lion. This is, this is the same David that by this time has already killed a lion and a bear. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, you can read about that. No, it wasn't because he was scared of a, of a lion. It was because he knew that his enemy need, needed to be defeated by God and his hand and not by David's hand. That's how he would be vindicated. Did not taking matters into his own hands. Deliver my life from the wicked, from the men of the world who have their portion in this life. David recognized that one of the characteristics of his enemies is that they look to the spoils of this life and they just don't even think about eternity. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of those people, as David points out in this psalm, seem to have a lot of satisfaction in this life. David said, whose belly you will fill. They are satisfied with children. They leave the rest of their possessions for their babies. So David David's understands, hey, listen, it doesn't always play out the way I think it should play out in, on this planet, but in the scheme of eternity, I get how it all plays out. So then he goes on in verse 15, as for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. So David here contrasts himself with his enemies. They're only looking to fulfill their lives on this planet. David's looking to fulfill his life in eternity. And he says, I will see your face. That after death, David was confident that he would one day see the face of God. And he would have a righteousness, a right standing with God when he was within his presence, which would enable him to see God's face. Uh, we have the righteousness of God in Christ. So we are right with God through Jesus Christ. He has granted us that by faith through what Jesus did. David had an opportunity to have a total dependence on his God without the promise of what a Messiah had done because Jesus had not yet come. But David had seen God make true his covenant and come good with his promises time and time again. So he knew that he was worthy. Um, David knew that the, the, there was going to be some transition from, from this life to the next when he died. And he knew that somehow when you died, it would be like waking up into a whole new eternity. And he knew that it was something that was I shall be satisfied when I awake. He knew it was something that was going to be incredibly wonderful. Guzik said, we tend to think of heaven and its realities as uncertain and as a cloudy dream world. In truth, it is more than our present environment, which by contrast will seem uncertain and cloudy when we awake in God's presence. So David here has a focus on eternity, but he's not ignoring the troubles of the present day that he's in. And, and again, he did not have the understanding of what life after death was going to be like compared to you and I, because he didn't have the rest of the Old Testament. He didn't have Jesus. He didn't have the New Covenant. He didn't have the New Testament or the teaching about end times and about heaven. He had none of that. Nobody in the Old Testament had that. But he knew that when he received God's righteousness, that he would see God's face and that it would be a wonderful reality. And in fact, Paul was going to write over a thousand years later in Romans chapter 8, for uh, talking about God, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. The destiny of God's people is to be conformed in the image of God through the righteousness of Christ. Not everybody chooses that way, but it's God's predetermined plan that that's what would happen if everybody would receive the free gift. So what does that lead us to observe? I would say for me, uh, it's, it's quite short, actually. Um, I think it'll be a wonderful thing to see the face of God uh, and to feel that uh, you are living in his righteousness in eternity, even though you go through the turmoils of this life. And I think for every one of us, we go through times when we've been wronged and uh, there's a process of how we bring our cause to God, and it has to start with God, show me where I'm wrong. 
Show me if I need to be corrected. Show me if there's something in me that needs to be changed or modified, and I will change and modify it, but then I, I'm asking you to, to do what's right in this cause. So a couple of observations. What do you observe? What does it mean to you? What do you personally get out of it? Leave a comment below, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you for the journey that David takes us on time and time again of total dependence and calm confidence in his heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen.